talking about the idea that there's this logarithmic attenuation of life with death. And these graphs show, are basically taken with a sensor that's a, a PAR sensor, post synthetically available radiation. And if you remember from the field, that was from 300 to 700 nanometers, right? And so that's a total spectrum that's available from photo sensors. <coughs> but the next thing we need to think about is that specific wavelengths of light are, are absorbed differently in waters of different composition. <coughs> and so there's basically three major ideas that we need to throw out relative to that. Maybe a fourth that is on here. The first, pure water transmits blue light the most efficiently. Okay. And that's why, really, pure waters look quite blue to us. And for that reason, the sky is blue as well. And we'll get to that in a sec. Chlorophyll absorbs red and green. Red and blue, I'm sorry, and allows green to pass. And cyanobacteria have special pigments in them that allow them to use green light. So that's why they're cyano or blue green colored. So the first point is that the absorption spectrum of pure water. And that's on this graph. On, on the x-axis, we go from 200 to 800 nanometers, 800 nanometers being out in the infrared, 200 nanometers being in the ultraviolet region of the spectrum. And on the y-axis, we have the percent transmittance per meter of these different um, wavelengths. And what we see is that there's this very sharp increase in, in absorption, so decrease in transmission, in the red and the infrared. That means light is very effective at warming water. Right? It also means that if you're looking at, say, a lake that's quite clear or the open ocean, and you look down into it, what you're seeing that comes back up to you is the light that is basically reflected off of small particles and comes back out and hits your eye. So it comes in from the sun and then gets reflected back out. If the chance, the probability is greater it will be absorbed by the water if it's red than if it's blue, the chance of the light getting back out to your eye is less if it's a red wavelength than if it's a blue wavelength, right? So that's why the deep lakes look blue. blue. It's also why the sky looks blue because the water vapor is so it's essentially preferentially taking out the reds and reds and the yellows and the greens, and it's reflecting back to you that blue that, that is reflected sunlight off the surface of the earth. So this brings up a difficult thing, the idea of what we see versus what's absorbed. And we'll get to that more. It's probably a good idea to keep to learn these wavelengths in nanometers, what they mean, and to visualize it. The, you can actually see the visible part of the spectrum right here. I've just overlaid the colors that are associated with those wavelengths. But outside of this, we can't sense ultraviolet with our eyes or infrared with our eyes. We'll be able to feel it as a sense, sense of this heat, but not, not with our eyes. So this is a series of graphs that have different um, spectral wavelengths. And I need to get the figures from the book. Make sure I've got these all right. Okay, so this is this is pure water is essentially the first graph. And just like we said before, as we go from in the visible spectrum only mainly now, from 400 to about 800 nanometers, we get more and more absorption as we go out into the red region. Right? That's the first point that we just we already made. And then I mentioned that chlorophyll, so this is actually the spectrum from a green algae, which is basically has chlorophyll A and a little bit of chlorophyll metal and chlorophyll B in it, where it has a peak absorption around 435 nanometers and another one around 680 nanometers. Okay, so that means that if this is in water, the red is being absorbed by the water, right? All this stuff over here. And the blue and the red that you can see is absorbed by the chlorophyll. 
So this is what the color that comes out. So if you look at a mesotrophic lake, it looks green to you, right? Or if you're down at Pot Lake, state lake number two, at about five meters lying there looking at the surface with your scuba gear, of course, um, the red light is being taken out by the water and the chlorophyll, the blue light is being taken out by the chlorophyll, and all that gets through is the green light. Okay, so if you think about a fish that's swimming around there, they're gonna have to be able to see the green light or not at all. And if they, if they see an object that need, they need, that that's need blue or red light to see, it's actually gonna look black. And we'll get to that in just a second. In contrast, this is an absorption spectrum from a cyanobacterium. And the cyanobacterium has those characteristic absorptions in the blue and the red that are associated with chlorophyll because they have chlorophyll, but they also have these pigments, these specialized pigments that absorb in the green region. And this allows them to photosynthesize in very little light. It also drives this part of this curve down relative to the green outcome, right? So when we, actually we saw that, um, I think it was planktolingvia in class, it had a different color to it than the pandorina and the euglena that were in the same sample. So the pandorina and the euglena had basically chlorophyll and no phycobilins, none of these pigments. But the, but the cyanobacteria had these pigments that absorb the green light. So they look blue-greenish. And so their old name is the blue-green algae. And we'll talk about the taxonomy. We, we now know they are bacteria. So their new name is cyano blue-green algae. Cyanobacteria, blue green algae, the same, same thing. So if you look at a, a cyanobacterial bloom, it can look um, blue green, um, sometimes even purplish. When we sample the bottom of that pot state lake number two, quite low down, there's not much light there, but there's a pretty good population of cyanobacteria that we pulled up from the bottom of that. And it happened to be sitting at the very bottom at the, at the time that we were sampling it. Almost no light makes it down there, but the light that does make it down there is in this green region, right? And so they can make a living on much lower light than some of the other species of algae. That becomes part of the reason they do really well in hypertrophic situations, that cyanobacteria blooms in very nutrient-rich situations because as the wind mixes the algae into the water, they're gonna have very low light. And so they can take advantage of that then and they will be superior competitors. There's a series of other adaptations that they have that allow them to dominate in those situations, but that's one of them. The last panel is the, is the last point that I haven't made yet, but that organic or humic substances also have characteristic absorption of light. And these are substances that generally enter fresh waters from terrestrial systems as the leaves break down and these chemicals are very complex organic chemicals that are sort of byproducts of breakdown and leaching of organic material, some of which maybe originates in, in aquatic systems, but mostly it's of terrestrial origin. And these, these uh, substances form what we call blackwater swamps, um, what we call the dystrophic lake, which means they're, they have nutrients in them, but they have no algae, not much photosynthesis. Dys meaning sick, right? Or they don't match the normal oligotrophic to eutrophic characterization. Um, and I'm sure some of you have seen these tannins or, or these humic compounds in uh, fresh uh, in water and streams say that have this sort of brownish color to them that's associated with this runoff of organic material. Organic material absorbs very heavily in the ultraviolet. So it's a really important um, factor in what the effects of these increases in ultraviolet radiation that we'll talk about in a little bit in this class. Um, if uh, water has a lot of organic material in it, it's not going to have a big UV effect on the organisms that are in it because it's going to sort of protect them from that. But also then it's absorbing more and more as you get into the red. So this gives these waters a brownish or a reddish color to them. Sediments oftentimes have a similar effect, that they tend to absorb more in the red areas than they do in, in the in, in the blue areas and they do in the red areas. So you get this sort of reddish color, particularly iron oxides, but even most sediments are brownish or reddish looking um, as, as they're in. So tunnel, which we didn't make it out to, 
is a good example of a highly turbid system that has that brownish color as opposed to the greenish color associated with a lake like Pot State Lake Number Two that has mostly algae and suspended sediment in it. All right, so what this means is that um, different colors of light are transmitted different degrees in lakes of different trophic status. So in the top panel, we have an oligotrophic lake. In the middle, we have a mesotrophic lake. And in the bottom, we have a eutrophic lake. And we see that most of the light is transmitted of all colors in the oligotrophic lake to down to seven meters. But the red lake is, red water is taken out preferentially, red light is taken out preferentially by the water. Okay, so that's why an oligotrophic lake looks blue. This red light, it doesn't have much chance of coming back out and catching you in the eye, right? It's, it's, it's the blues and the greens that can come out, blue more than green. In contrast, the mesotrophic lake has some chlorophyll in it. We're starting to see a flip here where the green light is, is transmitted just about as well as the red and the blue, maybe even a little bit better, a little bit better than the red and the blue. That's why mesotrophic lakes look greenish. They're starting to take on that chlorophyll color. And you need to remember, again, I mentioned this, you know, wh why is a forest green? Well, if you go above it, it's green. Why is the forest green when you're above it? What's happening? <coughs> sunlight. sunlight hits it, and then what happens to the blue light? It's absorbed. What happens to the red light? It's absorbed. What happens to the green light? It's reflected, right? Okay, now you're down underneath, you're looking up. It's green, right? Why is that? What happens to the green light? Some of it, all of the light gets into the leaf. And from the leaf, it can either be reflected out, right, or transmitted. <coughs> the same as in a lake. You know, some of it's reflected out, some is transmitted. So if you're looking up in a forest or in the bottom of a lake that's green, the red and the blue are absorbed, and the green is transmitted. And then the eutrophic lake, the blue is very strongly taken out, um, and, the, and the green is the most transmitted, so it would look, it would look uh, very, very green. Yes? Could you, could you go back to those other graphs? The slide sure. before. So like in the cyanobacteria, the blue-green algae, <coughs> if there's more red transmitted, wouldn't that make it look red? Yes, it that. would. If, if. It wasn't suspended in the medium it's suspended in. So what's the cyanobacteria in? Uh, water. Water. And where does the water absorb? Puts out the red. In the red, right? So you can see out there on the top panel, it's taking out that red. And if just the pigment was there, yeah, it would, it, you, you would, you'd see this. It's kind of out in the infrared, so it's not very strong. This is right at the level of where we can see really well, really well. I mean, we'll get some, but it's, it's the water that's in that, that makes it different. That's a, good, that's a good question. So these are just the pigment extracts, not the, not the algae suspended in, in the lake. All right, any other questions? Uh, you're, you're always, I'm always happy to take questions. Stop me if you don't understand what I'm talking about. As you can see, I'm picking up speed a little bit because we're already two lectures behind. This is normal. Um, so this always, leads me to ask you guys on exams and in class, why are lakes the color they are, fish the color they are, and fish <coughs> lures the color they are. So this is the example on the left-hand side of a hyper-eutrophic lake. It's got a cyanobacterial scum on the top of it, uh, very greenish. It's maybe dying off a little bit, so it's got kind of a brownish hue to it. And on the right, we're back to Crater Lake, which is a deep, deep blue color. Uh, and if you ever get a chance to get out on a boat or swim in a, a, a lake like this or in the open ocean, it's really uh, a, good, a neat experience. It's a little bit scary because you can see so deep. It's almost like if you have any fear of heights, it's almost like you're flying up above, way above something. So it's, it's really an interesting experience if you get a chance. So then, um, so, so uh, who, are, who are fish lures designed to attract? What, what is a fish lure designed to attract? Consumer. An angler, right? Yeah. And so a lot of these fish lures have these fancy colors to them that really don't necessarily translate 
to what the fish necessarily can sense in their environment. And, and we have then this, this full spectrum here. And then I've got a, a filter that just allows the blue light to go through, a filter that just allows the red light to go through, and a filter that just allows the green light to go through. Okay, so which of these panels would you expect if we're at four meters in Pot State Lake number two? Which of these panels would you expect the fish worse to look most like? This one here, right? So this one that has green and white contrast, it becomes almost all green, right? Because the white on it is reflecting all colors of light out, but the only light that's coming in is the green. And so the green and the white are reflecting exactly the same light. These actually become, you know, pretty contrasty. But they're probably no different than a black and white. Um, so another thing that we notice is that a lot of fish have uh, very bright red color, coloration to them. A lot of deep water fish have very bright uh, red coloration to them. Um, what, what do you think that those red markings look like when they're in that deep water? What color do you think they are? Okay, they're red because when red light hits them, it reflects back off of them and the other colors are absorbed, right? But how much red light is there deep in a lake or even in an ocean? None, right? So what color should those, those, those markings look like? Black, right? What's nifty about it is that a lot of times these fish will actually come up into shallow water for their breeding or their, or their mating. And so they'll, these red colors and markings will be obvious when they're in the certain near surface waters, but when they get deep, they essentially can be camouflaged. So a fish that is, has red marking on it will be quite bright in open water, in, in shallow water, but, but maybe cryptically colored in deep water. So that's an that's a, um, interesting adaptation. So you always have to think about what it is that the evolutionary response is to the physical side of the environment think from the point of view of the organism and where it is, not from the point of view of should I buy this fish for it because it looks nice. 